also she'll tell you about next, next month's program. My privilege this afternoon to introduce our guest speaker. His name is Roy Laughlin. And Roy is a lifelong Brevard County resident. Uh, he divides his writing efforts between scientific and technical writing and local history research and writing. He has written four books on local history and architectural heritage. Roy graduated from Duke University with a BS and from Texas A&M with a PhD in biology in 1977. He was a scientific researcher at the University of California, Berkeley and Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution. He began writing about science and other topics since 1990. In 2014, he published Good to Hear from You Again, a history of Coco's pioneer period. And then this year, Roy completed and published Rockledge Resort District, Winter's Eden. And he will be selling his books uh, after the meeting so you, I don't know what the cost is due. Forty-three dollars tax included. Forty-three dollars tax included, and you can see him after the meeting. Please join me in welcoming Roy Laughlin. I've been here once before, I think, and it was a pleasure then. So I'm looking forward to this. I'm going to assume that most of the people here are only vaguely familiar with Rockledge, so I'm going to start. A very simple explanation. And the first one, what is he talking about the Rockledge Resort District? Well, it's nothing that anybody in here likely had a chance to visit at any time in their lives, but if you went back to Rockledge from the 18, early 1880s until the 1920s, you would have been surprised down the waterfront east of where the hospital is to have found three major hotels, waterfront hotels, plus the bunker the east end of Barton Avenue as a winter resort community that was one of the hottest places on the Indian River for entertainment and winter tourism and dead closed up during the summertime. So let, let me show you the wrong one. Nope, that one. There we go. Let me show you first of all the area that I'm talking about. I got pictures of it. I didn't have to be there, but now this was on a minute ago. Hmm. Well, we may have to do this with only finger pointing. We're good at that these days. Yeah. <laughs> there were three riverfront hotels, and I'm going to start at the north end, the Plaza Hotel. At the middle, where the arrow points, was the Hotel Indian River. And at the south end, at the corner of Barton and what is now Rockledge Drive, was the uh, Rockledge Hotel, often called the New Rockledge Hotel. And I'll explain why they used to call it the New Rockledge Hotel. South of that, Barton Avenue went up about 800 feet from the river up to the top of the coastal ridge, the sand hill. And that had a couple of uh, major guest houses, as well as rental cottages, that were uh, actively available to tourists through from 1890 until about till after 1920 the white's guest house stayed open until 1930 but by and large the period that i'm going to talk about was that 40-year period from 1880 to 1920. Um, I'll, I'll modify that when we get to that point but but that's what you should think of as the decades of the winter resort district that I am characterizing here. Well, a second thing I would like to mention in order to give you the background to understand this, why Rockledge? You could put three winter resort hotels anywhere along the Indian River in those days. Rockledge was unusual because it was the nexus between the Indian River steamboat routes and the St. John's River steamboat routes. Now, it was only a nexus for about eight years, but that was enough to set up the resort district so that when the railroad reached Titusville in 1885, 
and really got rolling with, with its connection to steamboats in 1887, Rockledge was set up as a winter tourist destination with a national <laughs> reputation. It was able to cruise on that reputation for the next 40 years, and I'll tell you more about that reputation. If you look at Florida in the 1870s and early 1880s, you'll see St. John's River comes down here and stops. There's no roads, there's no railroads. If you want to walk through the Palmettos, you could go anywhere you wanted, but if you wanted to take life easy, you would like to cross over to the Indian River and continue south on that water corridor. You could get any kind of a boat that floated and be better off walking than walking through the Palmettos. This particular area was important because each of these squares is about a mile. And, sorry, this, each of these squares is about a mile here. And this is Lake Poinsett, this is Lake Florence. In 1878, two local Rockledge boys, Gardner Hardy and A.L. Hatch, went out and discovered this Lake Florence, which was deep enough for the smaller steamboats on the, Indian, on the uh, St. John's River to get through. If they got this far, it was a three and a half mile overland trip. That's compared to 12 miles to go from the St. John's River to Titusville. It was less than a morning's ride. And within a couple of years, both the freight traffic and the tourist traffic to the Indian River, lower Indian River region was dominant through here. Transportation wasn't that well scheduled. If you got to the shore of the Indian River, then you usually had a day or so wait, an instant opportunity for people who wanted to have guest houses and hotels. But again, it was better than going through the, the Piney Woods. So, I so, so in addition to the three resorts, I want to focus on a few other things. There was change through time with these hotels. If you uh, go into any kind of a book and you see a picture of a hotel, and then you see a picture of another hotel, and they were both in Rockledge, and you didn't have much background in, in the entire 40-year history, you go, well, how is this related to that? So part of what I'm going to show you is how these different resort hotels change through times, not just in names, but as well as their structure. The other neat thing for tourists was that it wasn't like a Disney theme park. Each one of those hotels and get, or guest houses had its own character. If you wanted a certain type of winter lodging, you could find it. And it, the appeal was to an identifiable <coughs> tourist set, the well-heeled people of the late 19th century and early 20th century who would come to Florida and stay in one place or certainly in one area for two or three or four months. They had room and board, they were entertained, and they were secure in these hotels. I'm going to start in the middle of those three hotels, go north and then south, and in the middle we had the Hotel Indian River. It was the iconic resort for, for two reasons. One, it was the largest, and the second was because the woman who started it, Harriet Wilkinson, established a reputation for strictly the best. And that was something that spread to the entire district and established Rockledge during 20 years as, if you didn't stay there the whole time, you certainly would be relieved to stay there part of the time on the Florida frontier. This building was built in 1886. There was a smaller hotel in its spot until October of 1884. It burned down, completely down, and was completely rebuilt. Harriet Wilkinson, <coughs> husband started rebuilding. He died. He was an older guy. He died. She finished it and owned it for a few years before bankruptcy. Her first building was the Rockledge House in 1882. House, guest house was where that comes from. And you'll notice that she advertised in 1882 in the Atlanta newspaper accommodation strictly first class. Okay, maybe that was aspirational, but she came a lot closer to first class on the Florida frontier than some of the other places, some of other choices for lodging. And that's described more in the book. Um, some of the accounts of what the alternatives were would have you laughing. But, but they were real life adventures. All right. Um, 
So she rebuilt it and it was finished in 1886. <coughs> she hired a well-known Florida hotel proprietor named J.M. Lee. And in 1887, he convinced Grover Cleveland, who was the president, to come and visit Rockledge. Can you imagine how much free press that editorial coverage generated? Not just for her hotel, but for the entire region. It set this place up better than any advertising or marketing campaign. But uh, Grover Cleveland is here, and this is his, his young bride there. I don't know who the rest of these people are. I'm assuming that that's J.M. Lee right there, because <coughs> Um, I, he just looks like he's in charge of things, but I could be wrong. <laughs> but that, that was virtually the entire adult pop, population of the upper Indian River in Rockledge that day that the uh, president came there. He stayed less than a day. He got off the train in Titusville in the morning, and he was on the train that afternoon and had dinner in Sanford, but he was here for one day to meet the people. He walked down what is Rockledge Drive now, so if you want to walk in the steps of a president, please come to Rockledge. We'll do a tour. I mentioned that there was a change in these hotels, and some of the, and much of it was that these were a work in progress during their entire existence. The, the hotel that I just showed you in the prior picture had little or no water running water inside, no utilities, nothing. By 1910, it would might have looked to people like the end. A wealthy industrialist from New Jersey bought it. He remodeled it completely. This is that building I just showed you with stucco on the outs outside. He took the second uh, floor balcony off. He built a stone pier that's still there. He built a big generating plant so that he could have electricity throughout the building. Rockledge had uh, more electricity in, by 1910 than the city of Cocoa had. Uh, it, it, this was featured in a General Electric magazine. These are cooling water tanks. And they get quite warm, and that warm water would be recycled into the hotel for warm water for cleaning and. I don't think it, they used it for bathing, but they use it in the kitchen and other places for, for heated water. And that, that shop was there for many years. I think it lasted into the 40s or even later. So that, that's a quick <coughs> characterization of the Hotel Indian River. We're going to come back to it in a little subtext here in a minute. On the north side was a hotel that I showed you a picture of and introduced it as the Plaza Hotel, but like the Hotel Indian River, it didn't start out with that name. It started out as Rider's Landing. It was essentially Phoebe and Stephen Rider's home that started out as a Grove home. And when that landing at Florence Lake Points up was established, he, like A.L. Hatch and Gardner Hardy, decided that he could make more money catering, catering to tourists than picking oranges. So he opened his house to tourists, he enlarged it, he had a drayage service, he opened a store, and, because if you had a drayage service, you didn't pay for shipping and your goods would have a competitive advantage in the local market. And uh, he also became the postmaster in about 1881 or two, following uh, H.S. Uh, Williams. So this was sort of central Rockledge for a few years, but life was tough. His wife divorced him. She moved back to New York with the kids. He lost lost her help in the store, and uh, things changed with the opening of good mail through Titusville. His store people didn't need to buy stuff only from local stores. He went bankrupt in the store, <coughs> and then he borrowed money from a, a local lender, and that local lender, Fred Taylor, the Taylor Park. Coco and Rockledge Taylor, uh, took it up by bankruptcy and remodeled it and reopened it as the Plaza Hotel. Now, I think the Plaza Hotel was probably the most architecturally impressive hotel of the three, with its three-story uh, roof over the piazza. It was elevated off the ground. It was probably the closest to the river of all three of the hotels. 
An interesting aspect of this building, when Fred got possession of Ryder's Landing, that first building I told you about, he moved it back off the bank of the river. And it's incorporated into the back side of that building. And then he put this front wing and that side wing on. So Ryder's Landing continued to exist from 1880 until 1920 when this building was raised, was torn down. There's still an oak tree. This oak tree right here, right there, is still growing on the riverbank near a pier at the end of Valencia Road. So some of, this, some of these trees that are in this picture are still there. So when you cut down an old tree around here, just remember, it's there because people left it there. And they had a reason when they did it, maybe they would do it. Maybe we should leave it too. This is uh, a picture of the hotel, uh, Plaza Hotel from the railroad terminal. See this right here? This is the cupola on the top of the hotel. It's not the same as Ryder had, but Ryder's Landing was famous for having that cupola up on the third floor, up the top through the roof. He had a lantern up there in the early 1880s that he kept lit all night. It was like a lighthouse. It was a uh, beacon, navigation beacon for the early sailors and very earliest uh, steamboats on the Indian River. And although this had no, no, I haven't read that it ever had any navigation use that he kept a light in it, he kept the concept in the Plaza Hotel, the Taylors did, and put that up there. And this is the view from the top. Uh, this is the uh, train terminal right here. Many of, some of you, somebody mentioned about the old, hotel, old hotels. You may have heard the story that it was only this hotel and Ormond Beach had a passenger terminal from the main line to the waterfront where the hotels were. That's kind of sort of true. Almost all these towns had freight lines to the waterfront. And it is true that this was a passenger terminal only. So it wasn't that unique, but it was still very important to this particular resort community because passengers, the train would back down. Passengers would get off if they went away from where I'm standing. They went to the Hotel Indian River. And if they came to this side, they came to the Plaza Hotel. That spur was built with a mutual agreement between uh, Michael Dwyer, who owned the Hotel Indian River at the time in 1892, and Fred Taylor, who had just gotten ownership of the Plaza Hotel from Ryder, that they would each give 25 feet at their property line to give a right of way of 50 feet if Flagler would put a spur down there, which he did. And then he took it out as soon as the two old men dies. When Fred Taylor and Michael Dwyer died in 1906, I guess the railroad people figured the agreement could be changed. They took the, tr the famous story they came on a Sunday when the courts would not issue an injunction, tore the tracks out. Before they tore the tracks out, they literally did pick up the uh, passenger station and carry it up on the main line. They had to return it. But he didn't, he underestimated Blanche Taylor's metal. She sued him a couple years. It took him all the way up to the Florida District Court of Appeals and won, sort of. The railroad claimed they had to, do, to reduce the number of spurs for safety as required by federal law. The Taylors argued a contract is a contract. So what they got, what the railroad got was the agreement that, yeah, you, you couldn't run that spur safely but they ended up paying the tailors back $15,000, which back in those days was plenty of money even for the railroad. So they both won, but the railroad spur was gone. Uh, there was still a passenger station up right near the US-1 corridor that's there now, and I'll mention more about that in a minute. It was active year-round at first, but over time it became less and less active. Another really important building in the early days of the tourist districts, district was this Magruder Pier, which is shown here. This started out, this started out as a store. There were rooms up in the front. This was a plank wharf. There was a warehouse here. This was it's had a couple of wood cranes so you could lift heavy loads in and out of boats. This was the eastern end of that road that went back and forth between the St. John's River and Rockledge. 
And for about five years, this was built in 1884, opened in 85, for about five to ten years, it was really an important stopping point in Rock Ledge because uh, first sailboats and later the, even the largest steamboats could dock at this pier. Uh, for example, the steamboat Indian River, which carried President Cleveland, stopped at that pier. I know because I got a picture, it's in the book. And, uh, and, but when George bought this property, the first piece, he literally just bought right along the river. He didn't own this for a year, but business was good in that first year, and he bought that acre with the help or with the, in collaboration with some Connecticut industrialists or investors, as they were called. And by 1888, he had sold out his interest in the pier and to, the, to those people from Connecticut. And one of those men finally owned the whole thing. His name was Horace Shares. And he, he built, or he converted a large hall, this building right here, that George Magruder had built. It was kind of like a stealth hotel. It was described in the newspaper as a public hall. And when he opened it in the spring of 1888, the May Day party, was, which was the big sailboat race once a year in the upper Indian River. Part of the, the social activities at the end of the race in the evening were held there and also at the Hotel Indian River. But within a year, Horace Shares had emerged as the primary owner and he began to make it clear what he'd really rather have is a hotel. And that became the new Rockledge Hotel so that people would differentiate it from the Rockledge House, which had burned down about five years earlier. And uh, after about 1900, it, you'd see ads for the Rockledge Hotel and occasionally the new Rockledge Hotel. But th that, was, that was there from 1888 until 1922. And the new Rockledge Hotel. See, here's approximately what, what George built. You have uh, the hotel in the front, second store, story veranda. Uh, behind was a kitchen, a uh, dining room, and some rooms upstairs. Notice on the far side, there's nothing there yet. But, but if we would go to up to 1900, the shares added a substantial southwest wing and a little bit more behind. And so they went from probably 40 or 50 people to maybe 150 people. And uh, it was a well-known higher-end hotel for people from the Northeast in particular. And uh, the family owned it, the Shares family. Unlike the other hotels, the Shares family operated it continuously from 1888 until 1912 when this guy Rankin from New Jersey, who bought, had two years earlier bought the Hotel Indian River, he bought this too. And if you go to Rockledge and you see the house on the south side of the road, he owned that house. So he had about 600 or 700 feet of river frontage, including his own residence and those two hotels. He was a millionaire then, and he had the money to keep those places open and to renovate them so that they were up to snuff to any urban environment in the Northeast or Midwest. This place changed just like all the others. After Rankin bought this, he took out the second story veranda. Like back then, they changed from wearing all this dark yellow clothing to wearing less and to being uh, more willing to get sun in their, on their skin. And um, again, you see the pictures, constant change, constant renovation, constant attempts to keep this place different from every few years so that people who came back didn't get into a rut and fill. Now, I, I've given you a quick description of the hotels as they existed. There's really a lot of interesting stories about the people who were involved. And in the book, I've got chapters, biography chapters, for each of the major owners of each of the hotels and the major people in the resort district. And I'm not going to talk about those today, but I do want to tell you about one thing that they shared in common. That is, 
you know, they were all active in the 1880s, some as early as, as, as 1880, 81, 82. The shares were a little bit later. They, they are, excuse me, forget about the shares for a minute. But the three people that started the hotels, ha, ha, uh, the Wilkinson, Stephen Ryder, and George Magruder, all lost their properties to bankruptcy or financial stress in the case of George Magruder between 1888 and 1891. And the good news for Rockledge, not for the original owners, but for Rockledge, was that they were all bought by much wealthier people who could, with deep pockets, who could keep spending money to upgrade those hotels <clears throat> and keep them current. And some of them were celebrities. Uh, Michael Dwyer was the most famous horse racer and horse gambler in the United States at the time. And he wasn't wealthy by the time, by 1900, he was impoverished, but his brother was wealthy. And between him and his brother, they kept the Hotel Indian River going until uh, William Rankin bought it in 1910. The Shares family was wealthy enough to keep the Hotel Indian River, I'm uh, sorry, the, the new Rockledge Hotel going, but they managed it themselves. And then on the north side, Fred Taylor's daughter and son-in-law managed the hotel. So, and they managed it for about 20 years, 15 years before they sold it. So what happened that synchronized those property turnovers in, in that time period in the early, between 1888 and 1890? Um, uh, out of, a little out of sequence here. I'm going to come back to that. Just hold that thought, please. Um, in the, we, we've talked about the hotels, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Barton Avenue. Um, there was a large house at the end, built by a guy named um, Merwin, who was from Connecticut, very wealthy. He pioneered oyster aquaculture and became very wealthy in Connecticut doing that. He came down here to grow oranges and to grow pineapples down in Eden. He was he bought property from Richards and the Richards family in 1888. There was an Oaks Hotel that started out with a guest house, White's guest house here. The Rockledge Hotel eventually bought these properties and had it as part of their hotel establishment. And there were some uh, several other pr properties that were primarily um, Residents for people who had rooms for let to rent, particularly during the tourist season. Right. We look at Barton Avenue about 1888, or a little early, 86. Looks like a place to walk quick in, doesn't it? You don't want the snakes to jump out. <laughs> By 1894, it was, it really looked like a ninth, uh, early 20th century, late 19th century subdivision. This house, this house, that house, and the houses you can't see there. They're all still here. They're still they're still in existence. They're, they're still being lived in. So um, people that built those houses knew what they were doing. Let's look at the Oak Hotel. This one's fascinating to me. It started out. As, as a house, a, a carpenter named Auger Wheeler, who probably worked on the hotels, built that as his winter residence. And by, certainly by 1894, he was bringing guests with him from Connecticut to stay for weeks or months with him. His wife did all the work, she died first. <laughs> and when she died, he, he lived another couple of years and followed her. His son was an organist, and he didn't want to come down here and clean up after people. He wanted to stay up and playing churches up in Connecticut. So he first leased the hotel for a year to a family whose wife died taking care of the hotel. This was a real wife killer. But the young, the, the, but the people, the youngs had a woman, the Wakefield, Miss Wakefield, who was sort of their manager. And when mm -hmm. Mrs. Young died and Mr. Young didn't want to keep the hotel, she wanted to keep operating it, and she talked to a Connecticut person, another one of that Connecticut contingent, whose name was Fred Baldwin. And he, his parents owned a riverfront house in Rockledge, which is still there. But they were Masons. They, made their, they came down here probably to work as Masons 
during the growth, early growth of the hotel district, Fred would come down here and work in the winter times and, and go back home. But he decided that if Miss Wakefield would manage that hotel, he would buy it. And because he was a contractor and into construction, he had in his mind, I can make this bigger and bigger. And by the way, I'm going to marry Miss Wakefield's mother. So he married Mrs. Wakefield, who was a widow, and the th Miss Wakefield and Mrs. Baldwin, Wakefield Baldwin, and Fred Baldwin managed this hotel until 1930, when they sold it finally. But he, Fred had a very phased expansion plan. He enlarged it to the, to the west, then he put a gable on the end and built a couple of rooms behind. And then finally in the 1920s, you had a, a really large hotel, 150 <coughs> people. You'll notice these nicely spaced windows in the front. That costs money if you want to view. But I, I used to say, how could you have 150 people in there? But look at how closely spaced these windows are. And, and from the back side, they were literally single windows. It was more like a monastic cell. And, and they had a nice dining room. And uh, he did offer parking in his garages. But it really did, he didn't have an orchestra. He didn't have big bridge games and things like that. Didn't have dances every week like the resort hotels did. But if you want to go over the resort hotels, you might have to put in a little bit of money for admission. But you could live on the cheap in his hotel and enjoy all the amenities in the other hotels. You got tired of the hotel anywhere where you go up to the Plaza Hotel, they might have had a better the band playing that night. So this uh, this particular hotel survived until the 1970s. The next one up the street was White's Guest House. It was just a place to stay. It was more like a boarding house. People would come down and stay long term, but they did cook your food. They and uh, it had several separate apartments. The Whites lived in this house right here. It wasn't built by the Whites as their residence, but it became their residence in 1898, and they lived there the rest of their lives. He died there in 1914, and she died in 1932, so we're talking some long-term residents. This house here has been recently restored. It's on Barton. It was a tenement that Auger Wheeler built and had been rental for a long time until 1914. Then it became the Rockledge City Hall. It, and then there's still the jail in back of it. So if you're down in Rockledge, you may want to take a look at it. One of the things, believe it or not, that tourists liked in their winter resorts were churches because people were, they weren't more religious, they were more observant. Rockledge had a Presbyterian church that was under construction from 1884 until it was finally opened and accepted by the Presbytery in 1887. Before that, in its first year, it was shared with the Methodists who eventually ended up building up their own church up in Coco. But there was a church because uh, Cornelia Magruder wanted a church and she convinced her stepson George to build the church for her. And then it was her, uh, her other stepson married the Presbyterian bishop over it, the daughter of the Presbyterian bishop, and they got their church. But th the reason I mention this is because the Presbyterian church has been one institution that has been around since the earliest days of the resort district and is still operating within about 600 feet of where its first church was built. This was its first church right there. It was a little off part. Remember I said there was a road that went out to uh, the St. John's River? Well, that road came in here, and then Barton was, was opened up about 10 years later. But this was, this was the Presbyterian Church. It was used for about 20 years, and then became, in a swap, the guy that owned the hotel at the time, Rankin, ended up with this property here, which the church was on, and the Presbyterian Church moved almost in a straight line this way to what is now Orange Avenue. It was the street that replaced the railroad spur when the railroad spur was removed, and they built a really nice church there starting in 1912, and uh, did the usual embellishment of it over time. Their Sunday school was behind. And, and uh, there's now, I'll show you a picture of the 
of the church as it exists now it's on the other side of Orange Avenue. But that is an institution. I guess you could say the city of Rockledge, which was also incorporated there in 1888, is another institution that survived. But for something that wasn't a public institution, it was a church, it's interesting that, that it's still there within a hundred, few hundred feet of its original spot. That's a quick and dirty on the architectural heritage. There's a lot more, and it's in the book. <laughs> but one of the things that interests me, because I grew up in Rockledge, as I began to read, I said, you know, things that were that we really like about Rockledge, the tree canopy along the river, the scenes of the river, the waterscape and the landscape. The oranges are gone, but they weren't when I grew up there. All of that was something that I could understand from my experience. I'm not that historical. I'm not that old at all. But when you look at what was the major lore about it, early in its tenure, the steamboat lore was always there. And there are people who are still very, very interested in it. But during those days, it was the best way to go. It was the preferred way to go. There were several different, inter several different chapters in this story. The paddle wheel steamers on the Indian River started in 1885 and lasted till a big freeze, and until um, 1895. And after that, they decreased in importance dramatically. Their primary money-making business was freight, with no agriculture in that winter after that freeze, and no orange crops like they had from 1880 to 1895. It, the train could take care of whatever shipments to northern markets was needed, and they just out out competed the steamboats, the paddle wheel steamboats, the, the 200 to 300 foot steamboats. They just couldn't compete. They were dinosaurs. In the very earliest days of the Rock Ledge Landing, that was only for uh, six or seven or eight years, 1878 to 1886. What happened in 1886? We have El Nino cycles that some of you long-term residents may be familiar with. We have really wet years followed by really dry springs and dry summers, and the Indian, especially all of fresh water like the St. John's River goes down and down and down. Well, the latter years of the 1870s, we had three hurricanes filled the river, St. John's River, up. No problem for the steamboats to come in until 1886. The last scheduled passenger ships, passenger paddle wheel steamboats, to come to the Rock Ledge Landing were in April of 1886. And um, I don't want you to think that I'm telling you, and they never came back. The Saint, the, the, the Landing out at Lake Poinsett was used for decades afterwards. They were used by people who just wanted to go fishing in the St. John's River. They were used by smaller boats that, that were naphtha powered. When I say this, the, the steamboats ended, I meant the paddle wheel steamboats, not, not all shipping. And uh, so, but, but that was what was part of the lore for the people who wanted to come this way, that was the best way for them to come. The other thing that happened was in 1885, Flagler expanded his railroad down to Titusville. And uh, 1885 wasn't a big year for change because the railroad stopped there, but they really didn't have much of a steamboat fleet. But the steamboats started to become more numerous, they were not large but they became large by 1887. So the pictures that everybody puts up on the wall of the big steamboats, big 200 to 300 foot paddle side and rear paddle wheels, the San Sebastian, the St. Augustine, the Swan, the, those were 1886 to 1895. And then by 1897, eight, they were still operating down in Lake Worth, but not here. But we did have local small, smaller transportation, because it was no bridge to Merritt Island, no bridge to the Barrier Island. <clears throat> they had naphtha power, they were not steam, they were not wood burning, they were not steam, they were liquid fuels. You could get all the liquid fuel you needed on the train, regular deliveries every day. So the engines changed, the need for water transportation didn't. It was different though, it wasn't the big impressive boats. The reality was those boats were really primitive and difficult, to, not, not that comfortable, but they were so much better 
than uh, running from rattlesnakes and panthers and getting all cut up on saga, uh, uh, the palmettos. People had a really uh, romanticized view of it. This is the Astatula, one of the first people to come down that left a memoir, talked about he couldn't sleep in it because he couldn't stand up in his stateroom. There were dogs walking all over the, the roof over his stateroom, scratching. The men who were throwing the wood into the boiler were also the ones who helped prepare the food, and they were filthy. <laughs> and then there was, no, if, if you have, when you got up in the morning from your stateroom and you went into where you were supposed to get your breakfast, all the passengers who were, did not have staterooms were sleeping on the floors. And uh, th this guy, Herman Harold, he, he was from Pennsylvania, and he needed time out, and he didn't get it until he got to the Indian River. But when he got, when he got to the lake points that landing out in the middle of the water, there was no dry land out there. It was all swamp. They had mule carts that were raised up, especially those were built in cocoa. The, the house of the guy. Hammond, who was the blacksmith, it's still there near the Cocoa Public Library. His blacksmith shop was down on the river. He and his brother-in-law, who was a carriage maker, understood how to modify and build these. This, there's no uh, steamboat in as they're waiting for it. The steamboat would pull in, these mules would go out, they'd drop the passengers into there, and haul off across to Rockledge. Harold complained that that was the worst ride. It was popped the buttons off of his jacket. It was the worst ride he ever had. And when he got to Coco, he stayed in the Coco house. That was not very nice either. But he really praised the breath of fresh air that he got when he got to the river. So once you got there, the river was going to make things right. Uh, his opinion, if I could summarize, it really needed some improvement, this, this trip now. <laughs> Now, let's see. I'm not sure how this is going to work. Okay, greatly needs improvement. Let's see. Let's go to the next one. All right, I'm missing something. Let's see. What did I lose? Yeah, you double, double. <coughs> no, nope, I don't want to go that way. Let's go back. <coughs> okay, in another, the, the following year, a physician who was going to be the house physician at the Hotel Indian River, and he eventually became J.N. Wilkinson's son-in-law by marrying his daughter. J.N. Wilkinson was Harriet's husband. He came and said that really the, the boat cruise was down, but that when he saw the landing, he was ready to get back on the boat and just go back to Sanford. It was an overnight trip. <coughs> And he said when he got on the cart, the cart ride in wasn't that bad, but really he said when he came up over the sand ridge that the, near Wustoff Hospital and looked down over the orange grove and all of the mature oak trees and the growth there and the hotel, it was the most beautiful place and he really liked it. He thought that it was a place he should stay. And so his opinion was it was better in 1885 in, in November, October when he came, but it, there was no curb appeal when he got off at the, <laughs> the landing. Now let's see if I can do this right. Don't go too far. Don't go too far. There, uh, the final story, and there's the details of it are given in the book because I think she's such a good writer. Isaac Duffus Hardy visited in, in spring of 1886. She was on a new steamboat called the Juanita. And I guess uh, Hart and Smith figured that was going to run for another five or six years for them, but the low water didn't allow that. She was an English noblewoman who was a travel writer. She stayed in Rockledge for a month in February of 1886. She, just, she had a number of really great descriptions. She thought that the boat was nice, that she, the people on the boat were, were nice. She thought that the ride in was a big adventure because there was a guy that was cutting up and begging for his mother, for his dead mother's intercession that he would live long enough to get to the hotel. <laughs> it was, she's really a good storyteller, and, 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 and I include it in the book. But when she got there, she wanted to get on a boat and go down to, I guess she was planning to go on down to, Palm, to Lake Worth, Palm Beach. But she, she said time stood still. They were, they were at the edge of the world. She waited for days to try to get a connecting boat. Now, the 
Hotel Indian River was being rebuilt, so she stayed in the Rider's Landing, which was then uh, the, the Tropical House. Name changed, but it was still the same place. And she, it was very nice. She, it was a, she said it was, it was homey, but it was nice that the Hotel Indian River was going to give people from more sophisticated parts of the world anything in a hotel that they could expect anywhere else. And then she got on a train and went to uh, over to Tampa and to, and to uh, uh, Crystal River area. She never did get down there because the, inter the connecting transportation was not reliable enough for tourists who wanted to see more on this side of the coast to in any way budget their time or their money. So, so, her, so her conclusion, she had adventure euphoria. I mean, she really would have been fun to travel with, but she, her event stay. So that leads me, well, what did these people do when they were here anyway? Well, the most important group of tourists initially, including J.N. Wilkinson himself, were invalids and people looking for climate therapy. Fred Taylor, who invested in hotels, was a lumberman from Ohio and then from Michigan. He had bronchitis, and his doctor said, go to Florida or you're going to die. Well, he went to Florida for 15 years and then he died, so I guess it was worth it to him. He did die of bronchitis. Uh, J.N. Wilkinson died after the hotel. That was probably uh, aggravation from losing all of his investment in the area. But in addition, this was a great place to come down and hunt and fish. And the nature, this was on the Florida frontier. This was an area that was really full of nature until 1970. But then it was uh, literally the nature started right outside the perimeter of the hotel. For people who wanted it, and there were plenty of them, there was an opportunity to come down here for a conspicuous display of wealth and self-indulgence. And I don't mean Mar-a-Lago, but we still do it. Um, and, and along with that, access to celebrities and the economically prominent. For example, who was Samuel Barton? Anybody ever heard of Barton? I grew up in Rockledge. I knew about Barton Avenue. Never knew who Samuel Barton was. And there were no Bartons. There weren't that many Bartons back in the 60s, and none of them had anything to do with the street. Samuel Barton was Cornelius Vanderbilt's uh, nephew. And unlike Cornelius' sons, he had the ability to get along with people. When Cornelius, then the wealthiest man in the U.S., died and left him, something like an $85 million estate, which was really considered to be as wealthy as anyone should ever be. It was his nephew that he turned to, a, to as to be the executor of the estate. And uh, no doubt, Cornelius died in 1885. I'm not going to stand close to the speaker because of feedback. And when he died, he turned to his nephew, and his nephew came, and <clears throat> along with Samuel's son, Cornelius Vanderbilt Barton. And they were here for a while, but the son went down to Palm Beach County and bought a strip of land and was one of the three wealthiest landowners down there. So Cornelius, uh, sorry, for, so Samuel started the subdivision, sold lots for a couple years, sold about a third of his area, and then he sold what was left, including that front lot on the river with the big house on it, which is still there, to the uh, William Merwin from Milford, Connecticut, and the Merwin stayed for the next uh, 15 years in Rockledge with Barton Subdivision and made their significant contribution to the area. And those weren't the only wealthy people. There were plenty of others, but, but he might be the one that, as Cornelius Vanderbilt's nephew, had the most name recognition today. What about shooting and fishing? Well, this is what they did to get ducks out on the Banana River back then. <laughs> this is the fishing. We would, ne we would never keep fish like that today, but they did back then. Let's hope, if they didn't feed them to the guests in the hotels, and, and, and they often did, the local people lived very well on what wealthy people didn't want to eat, they only wanted to catch. Nature, people were fascinated by the nature that was in Florida. Top of the list, without a doubt, were alligators. There were no alligators in New York City. There were no alligators in Chicago. 
people who wanted to see alligators and were from New Orleans stayed in New Orleans. They didn't need to come here. But they were also uh, sort of fascinated in a kind of fatalistic way with rattlesnakes. Uh, the alligators, this was taken at the plaza, or sorry, that's the Hotel Indian River. There was a guy named uh, Harry Iyer who was well known as an alligator collar. And the people, he, he would, newspaper articles in the New Haven newspaper talked about if you go to Rockledge with all the other Connecticut contingent, talk to Mr. Iyer about the alligators. He calls them better than anyone. He would uh, take people on boats over to uh, Sykes Creek, and he would go into the bushes under the palm trees, and he would call an alligator, and he'd drag one out like this, <laughs> right here. And they'd all stand around this dangerous alligator and get a picture taken. And then Harry would put the rope back on that alligator and walk it back down into the slough where he kept it. And, uh, and it was there for the next week. There were two alligators that were later moved to the Hotel Indian River. And it was torn down in 1920 that one of those alligators was taken over to um, the, the Ayers a uh, half-brother's house, and uh, that was the Jamal, J Jamala Lapham's house, the Jelly Lapham side of the family. And it stayed up there until the 19, nearly 1940, and then it ended up being taken up by one of the Travis sons, uh, who ended up his, tra that Travis's son became a Melbourne resident and died here in the 1970s. But he kept it, he had a fruit stand up in Oak Hill, and he took that alligator. The other alligator ended up in a place on Rockledge Drive, and it was still around when I was a kid. It just got out one too many times, and Dr. Russell said he, his wife, his wife was a Packer, but he just said, after uh, May Packer got tired of calling everybody in the neighborhood, saying, the alligator's out, keep the kids in until we get it, her husband took it up to, uh, Ross Allen and traded it for three alligator skins and a knife. <laughs> so it was a big one. It was it was quite large. This is an interesting one. This is a bear. This is Josephine the bear right here. Maybe you can see there's a small kid. That's John Patterson. He was the son of one of the earliest cocoa settlers. And he graduated from riding bears to racing <laughs> speedboats in the 20s and 30s. But that that's... Could you imagine if you told some helicopter parent that they should put their kid on a bear for a ride down the street today? But this was a regular, this was a regular entertainment that came through the resort district in the 1890s, and the people from up north would come out and enjoy the bears. Not that much different from today. We go to aquariums where they have sharks. Then there was the nature nature, the landscape and the waterscape. And uh, this is, up, up here is the point that now has Oleander condominiums on it. It used to be called Oleander Point. This is, this is in front of the Williams House, which is the house that the county owns through its beach and waterfront. This is the Coquina Ridge that gave the place its name. Down here is a picture of the river by moonlight. Not that, if you were a photographer, you, of that area, you go, oh, that's just gorgeous. It just looks like the river does now. But people were fascinated with this, and, and it was very unsettled. You could walk out along the path. There was no river road then. It was a path. And walk along these beaches. And, you know, 600 feet south of the hotel district, you might be alone enough that if you shouted, no one could hear you to answer you. And, and that's just on the land. If you wanted to get on a boat, you could go over to the uh, beach, the Cocoa Beach area near where um, Patrick Air Force Base is now, and find whale bones and uh, seashells that were rare. Let me tell you about citrus. Citrus is an important story for me because I came from Rockledge, and when I grew up uh, south of where Barnes Boulevard is, there were still orange groves there the way they were in the 1890s. And there was an important aspect for the resort district of citrus. When people came down, they would go and pretend to be citrus men, briefly. They would go pick the fruit they wanted from the little packing houses. This one was just off Barton, I think. It belonged to the hotel. They would go out in the grove and, and you know, oh, look, you had some cool look at the oranges. And they'd pick a few and they'd eat them. The, um, there's a picture 
in the book of a guy that is dressed up like he just came out of an office for lunch and he's sitting there on a stool in the orange grove like he's waiting for the rapture. It was that interesting for them to come down here and see oranges. And I used to laugh at those kinds of pictures, but since lethal greening has destroyed the orange trees in everybody's yard, it's like, oh, over down there at island, they've got some oranges. Yeah, down there, they're selling them. They're good. You need to go get some. And slavishly, I do. Why did Florida Citrus have the reputation that it did? Well, if we go back to 18, 1885, the New Orleans Exposition. Florida won in a straight-on contest with the California growers the gold medal, best citrus. They swept all of the subcategories. Okay, big deal, Florida's a big place, right? Well, the guy that won the gold medal, C.B. Magruder, lived in Rockledge. He was one of the several people in the state that organized the Florida display of pineapples and citrus and all the other good agricultural commodities, winter, winter fruits that you could grow. His house is still in Rockledge. If you go drive up Rockledge near Rockledge Gardens, there's Magruder Avenue. That's the Magruder. That was his property. Go down Magruder Avenue to Rockledge Drive, make a right second house. That's his house. The oldest parts of that building go back to 1868. That's where he lived. His citrus was all over that hill where Rockledge Gardens is and south as far as uh, where Indian River Furniture is. That the citrus that was the best in the country that won the gold medal was not just Florida citrus, it was Rockledge citrus. So these people that came to the Rockledge Resort District were in a nest of the best citrus in the world. And that was a big thing. When Isa Duffy was staying at uh, Tropic House every morning, when she came down for breakfast, there was a branch with oranges on it, and that was her orange fix for the rest of the day. And how many people are from around here? I know Barbara's here. It's true that Indian River citrus was the best in the world, right? No. And uh, people from the University of Florida will, in private conversation, at the Citrus Extension Service, they also will admit that. So, and it goes back to the time of the resort district, and it was a big thing for people here to know that they were coming down where the citrus was the best. So, I had a slide that was out of place, and it was about the bankruptcy, so let's return to that. In 1888, there was a yellow fever epidemic in Jacksonville, Florida. It was one of the last major uh, yellow fever epidemics that killed a lot of hundreds of people. It started in Jacksonville in the middle of the summer and continued through the fall. It was national news. People were going nuts in the city. They were, they, it was quarantine, but there were people that just ran out of the city into the woods. They're starving to death. They're, they're, they're a danger to public order. In, in Jacksonville, they're shooting cannons because sulfurous fumes were supposed to kill what caused those kinds of diseases. In other words, that people were totally falling back on superstition in order to look for a cure. It didn't work. <laughs> As soon as it got cold, in the, as usual, oh, you, of course, yellow fever vector is mosquitoes. I think you know that now. And as soon as it got cool in November, December, the train started running, the, the fever ran its course, the epidemic ran its course, the trains and the ships started coming. But still, tourists who were thinking they would come to Florida that year, to a significant extent, did not come down. And that when you were sharing the money with, that you were from your hotel with a manager, you really didn't get enough to pay your mortgage for your construction. And that happened to Stephen Ryder, and it happened to uh, Harriet Wilkinson. It didn't happen, obviously, to um, George Magruder, because he was in partnership with the money, money guys, but he formally transferred his share shares to uh, his Connecticut partners. He managed the hotel for another the, the public hall that became the 
uh, hotel, the Rockledge Hotel when the shares owned it by 1889. But George, who had been there for about five years, was out of the picture. And that had to do with the yellow fever. This is a, back then people didn't read very well. And there was no Fox News for them to watch stuff. So they had to look to other graphic images. And this was one that was very famous. This is Black Jack right here, who was a caricature for the uh, yellow fever. He really had his claws into Florida, who was being rescued by Columbia, the United States. And what was the United States doing? Well, you ever hear of a guy named Walter Reed? He was, yes. he's, he was in a hospital up in Maryland then. But he was the head of the Army's um, Health Department, the Army Health Corps. And he had been talking to a guy down in Cuba who told him that if you were to control mosquitoes around your living areas, that you could probably not see yellow fever epidemics and dengue and some of the other fevers that were really messing them up. And so he, over time, did some experiments, and a guy named Porter over in Tampa stopped the next, 10 years later, stopped the next yellow fever epidemic that would have exceeded probably what went on in Jacksonville. So that meant there was a poor tourist season in 1888. And so that left the hotel district wondering, now how are we going to do this to make it a to summarize, what they did was to change the focus from winter resort to health resort. And it was really a tremendously effective way of keeping the resort district going past what would have been probably a terminal event for which they had no responsibility, uh, that they being the hotel managers. And uh, I discussed that at greater length. So what happened to these resort hotels? Well, they literally disappeared in two years. The Plaza Hotel was torn down in 1920, and the other two were torn down in 1922. But they didn't go easy. But what, why did they fail? Well, they were only open by the World War I era for about two to three months a year, and the rest of the time they were totally closed up. This is a picture of the Hotel Indian River when it was closed, when this guy uh, Hibbs was there as the caretaker. Drive past that in August, and you're not going to come back in January thinking that you have a nice place to stay. And even a wealthy industrialist, a millionaire, couldn't afford to keep a place for 10 months so they could run it for two. The group aged out, and you know, if, if any of those groups, members of those groups were invalid, the germ theory had been accepted. People knew if they were sick, they didn't need to go sit down on a veranda in Florida all winter. They needed to go to a hospital and get some real therapies. They didn't have penicillin for another 20 years, but at least they could get hospitalization. And the younger people that could have replaced these older people that had, knew about germ management from the World War II military experience, they didn't want to get on those sick people. So, so the clientele aged out, and the young people didn't want to be around sources of contagion. So that a major subgroup, the in, infirm and the invalids, were out of the picture. So as I said, the hotels were raised in 1920 and 22, but that wasn't the disaster that, that you'd have thought. There was, in fact, all of this material being offered for the locals to buy it. And there were probably the north end of Cocoa, many of the homes on Merritt Island, and a few on Cocoa Beach were, uh, that are still standing, still being lived in, were made of salvage material. <clears throat> and finally, many of you may remember an old hotel in downtown Rockledge, I'm being facetious, there in the riverfront of Rockledge between Orange and Barton. That was in our day, called the Hotel Indian River. But it started out life as a 1920s land boom hotel, the only hotel after, because the other all had been raised. And a lot of people that I talked to go, oh, yeah, I remember that, those hotels. Well, probably you don't. But you, do rem you can remember that one. And that one was raised in the mid-1960s and was replaced with With, with a, 
condo, this one, this one was the Indian River Club here. This one. <clears throat> Well, the one, the, the Plaza Hotel, which I promised to show you, this may have bad batteries. The Plaza Hotel was replaced with a Presbyterian church, and we'll probably see it when I least expect it. This cement hotel, this cement dock that was built about 1912 is still there in front of the condominium. Now let's see if I'm going to, this is the New Rockledge Hotel is another condo. And um, if there are any further questions, I'll be glad to field them. But first, <coughs> these are some other books I've written. At First Glance is under review. That one, if you're interested in Coco, is available on Amazon. That one's available on Amazon. And this one will be available today. And you've gotten the Saturday Review scenario, the description of it in this talk. But there's a lot more detail about the district, about, there are probably more pictures of, of the area during that era than you're going to find in any one place. And uh, I've described it from its architectural heritage as well as from the, through the biographies of people that who, who made it what it was and then saw an end to it. Uh, I was, you know, as a native, I had heard stories about those, but I never really understood what happened to these things. And so it was a, a specific um, goal of mine to explain not just how they started, but how they ended. And I don't think you'll find much of that discussion anywhere outside of the, the uh, Coco Tribune. Thank you. Well, there you go. Okay. I'm going to say. Okay, well, thank you for your attention, and, and um, I do have copies of this book for sale, and they're back there, and I'll be glad to autograph them for you if you'd like. That's interesting. What you said makes sense about the, the stock, the era stock, that era stock. But then some of us are local, who are familiar with local hotels, like the trade winds in the Atlantic, uh, that popped up later yeah. well, in the 20th century. Yeah, it was that whole era that got those. What? what? If, if any of you all are familiar with the Coco area, you'll remember the Brevard Hotel that was on that point of land that was Magnolia Point. That hotel opened within months of the three hotels in Rockledge being torn down. Gus Edwards, the Coco Beach developer, thought he could make a real estate killing by taking down the hotels and selling the property to people who own their own homes in that resort district, and that didn't work at all. That was just too far from anything that was entertaining. The movie theater was in Coco. The restaurants were in Coco. The train station was in Coco. Uh, any of the stores, the grocery stores, anything you need was a mile, a little more than a mile away in Coco. And Coco bloomed like crazy. It also had the bridge over to the beach. And and Rockledge just sat. And some and and when the Brevard Hotel opened, and people were driving up and staying in it. I got one of the earliest settlers said, we, we got to do something about this. They're, they're, they're taking all of our fire. So he tried to get local investors to build the last hotel that I showed you before. So, and it, the first six weeks of it flopped. And then he convinced a local Rockledge resident, Martin Metzner, who was a New York real estate investor and winter visitor. Martin said, I'll give you $100,000, but only if you find at least another $100,000 to build the hotel. And when... And, and with Martin Metzner's involvement, they got 125 to 150 thousand, and they built that hotel, opened it in 1924. You may remember Marie Holderman, the editor of the Coco Tribune. She was the uh, one of the first female members of the Florida Press Association, and she became the first woman president of that organization in 1924. Young and intelligent and assertive, and she bought the. Florida Press Association national, uh, annual meeting to Rockledge sort of in the inaugural year to really get the hotel started off. And uh, it managed, the, the Messner family owned it from 1924. They owned the primary part and then they owned all of it until 19, and nothing to do 
everybody wants, they, they billeted most of those enlisted men, any that they could find a place for in Cocoa and Rockledge, and the people who owned the hotel at the time, and also the Oaks Hotel, turned it into boarding house. And that, that kept those through the 1940s. And then when the space race came in, there were still people who would want to stay in a place for a week to a month. It was like an extended stay place in the early space race. By the 1960s, people, the housing was ca catching up with demand. That was pretty run down. But it still had a beautifully uh, landscaped grounds around it. It had been landscaped since the 1890s. So it was still a neat place, but it was like an out of out of 20th century experience to go anywhere near it. Because like the rest of the bar to that story. Well, the one thing that I didn't tell you was that, and maybe this is the final time to say it and be quiet, the area that the hotel grew up in was an area that was welcoming to visitors. And I refer you to a letter by H.S. Williams that's in the book. Come here and we will work with you. So the community, Coco and Rockledge, had had a decades-long experience as a welcoming community to southerners as well as northerners people got along they worked together they made a living after world war ii it looked like that really wasn't a strategy that was going to work but it was it was it quickly became a welcoming community to an effort that was going to be a connection between earth and space and i submit to you that the experience that started with those resort hotels and what it took to make them nationally prominent on the Florida frontier was the same mentality that made this area a welcoming community on the frontier between Earth and space uh, 70 years ago now. So so it wasn't something that went away when the buildings were torn story down. Story, story goes on. The music continues.